It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here with all the week's news, plus a couple of clever attacks. One's called, cleverly named as well, one's called e-fail, and it really is an issue if you use PGP or S-MIME to encrypt your email. The other's called throw hammer, and I'll let Steve explain how that works. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 663, recorded Tuesday, May 15th, 2018. Ultra Clever Attacks. Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Flexible and entertaining training for your IT career. Visit itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, ZipRecruiter has revolutionized how you do it. Their technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. They find great candidates for you. Try it free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash security now. It's time for Security Now, the show where we cover your security and privacy online with this guy right here, Mr. Stephen Gibson of the GRC. And look, I'm lit up just exactly right today, Leo. I'm I'm not too bright, not too dim. So Have there has been a problem in the past? <laughs> You've always seemed just my, right to me. With my brightness? Yeah. yeah. See? All right, bright super now. bright now. What, did you get special lights? Uh, no. No, it's just that your screen behind you is sometimes oh it, it oh, oh oh that shot. Well, no, yeah, that's not a yeah yeah. No, I I changed your brightness on uh, on my end. Ah, yeah. So, so uh, we got a big one today, I think. Well, yes, uh, two very clever. I mean, two. Okay, <laughs> let me finish the sentence. Two very clever attacks. One against. Uh, Encrypted email in general, which so it affects the two primary encrypted mail technologies, PGP and and secure mime, S mime. And it's not a flaw in in either of them, uh, except that it exploits a weakness in the security protocol. But it's just sublimely clever. And when I when I as I was reading into it and I realized what these what the uh, these guys had figured out, it was like, oh, that's just so it's just like, whoa. So I thought, OK, we I just have to explain what they did because it just it's a toe curler. And then we as we always have said, attacks don't get worse. They only get better. And quoting Schneier, I think Bruce was the first person to say that. We have the inevitable evolution of Rowhammer that we were just talking about a few weeks ago because there was, in fact, it was last week about the the use of GPUs to uh, induce the Rowhammer attack because they're lightly, if at all, cached. Unlike CPUs that are that have sometimes multiple levels of cache, so you have to do all kinds of crazy cache avoidance in order to get down to the memory um we so now we have throw hammer which as its name suggests is remote row hammer and this is very worrisome because as we've often said when we're trying to sort of place attacks into a fair context well yes it's bad but you got to have bad guys code on the machine in order to be pounding on the RAM to get some some sort of leakage. Well, not anymore. Now you can do it over the net. So uh, that's throw hammer. So we will talk about both of these very clever attacks. But first, we got to catch up, of course, on the rest of the week's security and privacy news. We've got the evolution of UPN proxy. That was the the use of universal plug and play that Akamai 
discovered and we reported a few weeks ago, well, it's already evolved. We have a worrisome flaw discovered in a very popular web development platform that's probably going to get exploited. It hasn't yet, but inevitably. Three days ago was the first anniversary of the revelation of Eternal Blue, which the WannaCry crypto malware used to such devastating ends, and then several other um, malwares adopted. We're one year downstream, and we've got a sort of a chilling graph of the of the evolution in the use of Eternal Blue. We also have those GPON um, routers that were found to be uh, very insecure and exploitable. Uh, the, there are now five botnets f- fighting over them. Um, we have this week's disgusting security head shaker. It's like, okay, what year is this? And we're still making incredibly dumb mistakes. We have a, an interesting summary of the RSA, con- the recently completed RSA conferences security practices survey, where all of the attendees of the conference were asked to here fill out this survey of some interesting and some somewhat chilling results that we need to share. Uh, the appearance of the first persistent IoT malware. Traditionally, it's been possible just to you know unplug your light bulb and. You, because the malware was was running in RAM, well, that's not true anymore. We have uh, also, I encountered a significant misconception about hard drive failure relative, of course, to the use of Spinrite that I wanted to briefly address. Um, and, and that is this, the sense or the, the, the misbelief that a failing hard drive needs to be replaced. And it's not that that's not true. It's that the hard drives can have problems when they're not failing. And so I want to dig into that a little bit. I have an interesting bit of listener feedback. And then if, if, <laughs> if we're still on Tuesday, we'll take a look at these two very clever attacks. So, yeah, I think another jam-packed podcast, as you suggested. <laughs> I'm really curious about the PGP attack. Um, oh, Leo, so, uh, it's just sublime. <laughs> oh, my God, it's so cool. It's brilliant. I, I can't remember uh, uh, what uh, Matt termed. Uh, Matthew did a series of tweets, yeah. and uh, he called it uh, – I'm scrolling down here through it. Uh, he called it da, 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 a masterpiece in wow. exploiting bad crypto. Wow. He said it's an extremely cool attack and kind of a masterpiece in exploiting bad crypto. Oh, and yeah. So, yeah. A lot of I think everyone's going to like get a kick out of it. Good. Good. Well, before we get there, let's talk a little bit about our fine sponsors of the show. Couldn't be a better sponsor. Last time uh, I was in Gainesville uh, at their grand opening for IT Pro TV's new studios. Uh, we went to the party, and there were a lot of IT Pro TV customers there, probably 100, 200, big dance party, to a man and a woman. Every one of them said, say hi to Steve. They're all, <laughs> they're, all, they're all massive fans of security now, and I guess that makes sense. If you're not yet aware of IT Pro TV, you, know, you probably ought to be. IT Pro TV is the fun and entertaining way for you to either get a job in IT or, if you've already got a job in IT, to keep your skills up, to polish your skills, to learn new skills, get a better job, that kind of thing. It's IT training, but it's done right. And, and it's very affordable. If you were going to go to a technical school, you'd spend te- literally tens of thousands of dollars to do something you could do for, you know, $50 a month at IT Pro TV. Or even less. I'll tell you how you could do it even less. Let me tell you, first of all, about IT Pro TV. Um whether you're a seasoned IT professional or just starting out, IT Pro TV is the fun, the engaging, the easy way to learn, almost through osmosis. Because you can watch IT Pro TV on your computer, on your phone, iOS or Android, even on your big screen TV. They've got Roku apps. They've got an app for Apple TV, Fire TV, Chromecast. So it's easy to watch. These guys are great. They do 125 new hours live, just as we do. You can watch them stream it every week with a chat room and all of that. And then they add that adds to their library, which is now over 3,000 hours. 
and covers every area. So if you want to get into IT, you typically you'll want to not only study to learn the information, but also to pass the tests, to get the certifications. Because with that experience, that's the way employers of new IT professionals can can judge your 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 skill set. And uh, and by the way. This is a very good time to get into IT. One million open jobs right now in IT security alone. So you're listening to security now. I think you're probably already doing the the, the footwork to, to get this job. Then get the certs. CompTIA, Cisco, EC Council. That's the Certified Ethical Hacker Cert. VMware. All kinds, everything pretty much there is to know in IT. And with new content coming, there's always new stuff. You'll, if you have a team and you want to keep the team up to date, a lot of, a lot of companies and uh, universities do this. They use the IT Pro TV portal to keep track of uh, how the team's doing, you know, set up assignments, see the viewing time, the courses viewed, which tracks have been completed, all the metrics that you'd like to know. A great way to keep track of it. That's IT Pro TV's Pro Portal. It is a great way to keep your team up to date to accelerate your career. Choose a plan, create an account, enjoy the journey. Now, here's the special deal. If you go to itpro.tv slash security now, you can, you can click the button and learn more about their team solution. You can even get a free trial of the, of the team. Or you can sign up for yourself for a monthly membership, including a free seven-day trial. So you can try it for a week before you plunk down any cash at itpro.tv slash security now. Use the offer code SN30. That does two things. Let's them know you saw it on Security Now. That's very good for us. But it also gives you 30% off your subscription forever. For as long as you stay active, 30% off. Now, I'll give you an idea. The premium subscription, which includes uh, Kaplan IT's training practice exams. that used to, They used to call it the Transcender exams. It's now Kaplan IT training. Uh, that's great because you could take the test before you take the test. And really, that's very helpful. You also get the virtual labs. You don't need to have you know, uh, Windows Server 2012 or whatever it is you're studying, you can use the virtual lab to do it in a browser. All of that is normally about $857 a year. That's the premium account. Use our offer code SN30. goes down to about $600 a year. And they have, they have lower cost accounts, standard accounts as well. ITPro.TV slash security now. Use the code SN30. Flexible training, binge-worthy content, ROI proven, 90,000 members, and every one of them listens to Security Now. <laughs> ITPro.tv slash Security Now. And don't forget to use the offer code SN30. All right, back to you, Steve Arino. So our picture of the week was one that I've had in my picture file. It's not apropos of anything in particular this week, but I got a kick out of it because it does help to sort of, you know, there are a lot of people who are chafing at the idea of HTTPS. Um, we know you cannot have logged on sessions using browser cookies, web cookies, as which is the way you maintain session state these days, unless you have privacy in your communications. Otherwise, Anybody who's able to passively sniff traffic, as you can, for example, in an open Wi-Fi situation, is able to to um, to impersonate you by grabbing that session state. So HTTPS is where we're headed. It happens that the, the, the listener feedback that we have today argues against uh, argues against the idea that HTTP is dead forever. And I got a kick out of this because this is the, it, it, it's, it's a cartoon showing the traditional snake oil salesman telling you, you know, holding up a bottle saying that, you know, this special elixir will cure all of your ills. And so this on, on the tree, it says, Dr. Marvel's amazing HTTPS guaranteed to cure all website Security problems, except plain text passwords, SQL code injection, buffer overruns, social engineering, malware, spyware, adware, ransomware, Trojans, uh, something, C oh, CMS hacks, 
cross-site scripting, foreign URL injection, flash, ex flash exploits, Acrobat exploits, Java exploits. Otherwise, um, it's great. Otherwise, boy, this thing will fix everything that ails you. So, yes, I, I liked that because it's a nice counterpoint to everyone rushing to secure everything. I mean, we have to have that too. But by no means is it the cure-all for all of our problems with the web. It just means that a class of attacks are much harder to perpetrate and there's still lots of work left to be done. So, uh, you know, pretty much like health in general is like, <laughs> it's a large surface, a large attack surface. So, um, okay, I did want to follow up on last week's warning or caution or watch for it note about Spectre. Uh, it was, as we know, Spectre Next Gen, where the news is, it, and this was th this came from Heiss over in Germany um, and had been well researched and followed up and verified that there are eight new problems of un completely unknown type, one of which Google's Project Zero found, one of which is a biggie, and we don't know if that was the one that Project Zero found or not. We know very little about this. So I just wanted to say, we don't know anything more than we did. So I'll, I'll keep looking. But so far, this is a, a mystery. Um, at, certainly at some point, we will know a lot more. And the, the teaser, I think, is that the big problem is bigger than Spectre ever was. And that is either version one or version two of the original Spectre exploits. Apparently, what's been found is something substantially easier to exploit, which, which the reporting says really does represent a problem for a shared hosting environment. So uh, one of the bits that came out of the RSA survey of the people that were there, we'll get to that in detail uh, a little bit later, is that three quarters of the attendees are in companies who use cloud providers, Google, AWS, Microsoft. So those, you know, so three quarters of enterprises of the attendees of our, of the most recent RSA conference are using cloud services and cloud services are not the only, but certainly the biggest worry and the biggest target for this kind of exploit for something that allows you to break out of a VM uh, containment or or any kind of a sandbox or process um, okay so we uh, we talked about Akamai's or Akamai's announcement discovery that there are a lot of consumer routers with universal plug and play port, the configuration port, ex or maybe the file, it turns out, uh, exposed to the internet. And that as a consequence, uh, and, I, and we put it in the show notes when we talked about this a week or two ago, there's th that classic uh, sort of uh, spy internet, uh, uh, you know, like, where the bad guy bounces their traffic off all, like all around the world nine times or, tw or or 19 times, however many, in order to, you know, defy the authority's ability to track them down and then finally land somewhere, which, which was always a bit far-fetched because that suggested there were like all of these insecure systems everywhere. Well, <laughs> turns out that this with the ubiquitous presence of consumer routers on lands which of course I've been championing forever because it, it is a when properly done it is a really good hardware firewall I mean you absolutely want that to between I can't imagine putting a just a, a computer rot right on the internet ever without having the the NAT the, the stateful NAT layer, which 
drops unsolicited incoming packets. Well, unfortunately, with this crazy popula popularity of these routers, they're not all being done right. And so what we first learned from Akamai is that, that the routers NAT mapping where, uh, which universal plug and play is able to manipulate deliberately. It's the, the routers do not check that the, that the IP on either side of the packet are on either side of the router, meaning the only valid mapping that that translation table should provide is from LAN to WAN. There is never a place, well, there, there, uh, there's almost never a place for, for LAN to LAN, although there are some instances where you can reflect from the router back into the LAN, but certainly never from WAN to WAN, from the wide area network, the internet, out to the wide area network. Turns out there are routers that don't check that, which, which makes them a perfect target for somebody who wants to hide their traffic as botnets and various attackers want to. So that was the first instance. What Imperva, the uh, Imperva security firm, has since discovered is that, th that it is possible and it is being, it is actually being done that that the ports are being changed in addition to the IPs. Now, that's a, that that's not a surprise. NAT has to do that. That is technically it's um, uh, NPAT or NAPT. That is network, not not just network address translation, but network address port translation because ports are almost always being changed also. So because you need the, the, the NAT table needs to use additional information for pa for packets coming back to know where they're like to know where, where they're going. If, if, um, if three people on the LAN were all going to Amazon, then when the packets come back, they're all coming back from Amazon. So the, the, the destination port number to the router is the way the router knows which one of, in this example, those three people on the LAN that packet should go to because you, you just need additional, a, additional bits in order to encode the, the, the identity of the machine behind the LAN. So ports have always been changeable. What the bad guys have figured out is that one of the easiest DDoS mitigations, uh, the distributed deni denial of service, where, for example, you're using a bandwidth amplification attack with DNS or, or network time, either uh, DNS or NTP, is that the, the source address of the packets will be that of the service, like 53 or 123, respectively, for DNS and network time. So one of the easiest things that a DDoS filter can do, a, a, a simple way of, of, of mitigating these attacks, is simply blocking all incoming port 53 traffic or all incoming 123 traffic. That is, it, it's trivial to do that at the border of the network and just drop all the traffic. So because the bad guys are clever, they said, hey, this is another thing we can do using our, our, our NAT port translation is we can enlist the services of these, these accessible NAT routers all over the internet. And there's apparently on the order of 1.3 million of them available in order to translate the port number. And so the idea is they will use the DNS amplification in order to, in order to create additional traffic, then have that bounce through a 
one of these NAT proxies to, to and bounce off of the proxy so the traffic stays public but changes the source port to something other than 53 or 123 in order to bypass static DDoS filters, which many networks now have in place. So yet another way of, of using the, the unsecure and insecure technology in order to create additional traffic. Um, and specifically, and this is what was worrisome, what Imperva found is that many of these insecure routers actually have the, the XML file which describes the current mapping. It's root desc.xml is publicly available. Shodan has been searched for the, for the presence of that file and 1.3 million results were found. So, so you, you remotely modif you massage that file using the universal plug and play protocol um, or directly using that file and are able to essentially turn these, these 1.3 million consumer routers into little switch yards, bouncing traffic off of them, changing IPs, changing ports, and, and getting up to a lot more mischief just due to the numbers which are available and the fact that increasingly these are all very well-connected devices. So, again, attacks only get better. Um, also, I mentioned a, a very popular app development platform having a problem. There's a platform known as Electron, which... Um, I hadn't crossed my radar before because I'm about as far away from developing apps on a web platform since I'm using assembly language uh, as you could get. But Microsoft's Skype, Visual Studio Code, GitHub's Atom Code Editor, the Brave Browser, uh, including well-known desktop apps for services such as Signal, Twitch, Discord, Basecamp, Slack, Ghost, and even WordPress, that is the desktop services for those, are all written as a web app on top of this Electron uh, app development platform. Yeah, it's really common. It's basically Chrome. Right, right. So um, uh, That's and the negative is you have to bundle a copy of Chrome with every app. <laughs> it right. makes the apps quite large, which is, well, I know, and, anathema and exactly. to you. Yeah, exactly. Well, and what's what's worrisome, Leo, is that the developers understood that the Node.js library, while powerful and deep, is also dangerous to have on the desktop. So by default, they there there's a, a setting in the in the configuration file. There's a web preferences config file that has node integration set to false, which blocks access to the node.js APIs. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear this background noise? Yeah, a little bit. It's not bad. That's all right. Okay, good. Good. I've got the microphone turned away from it. They're, yeah, they're yeah. <laughs> grinding it's, up some trees outside. It's mild. I hear everyone's okay. all. <laughs> it's like Fargo. So, yes, it's not my stomach growling. Um, okay, so... They've got node integration set to false. But a security researcher, Brendan Scarvell, with Trustwave, discovered that it's possible to flip node integration to true. This can occur if another setting in the file, WebView tag, uh, which is normally set to false, has not been explicitly declared. In that case, it's possible to use a cross-site scripting instance to, to create an instance which has node integration set to true and then be able to run an attacker's code on the machine where this, where, where this as you said, Chrome, essentially HTML, JavaScript-based system is present. Um, he discovered this in March. He privately reported the flaw to the developers who immediately fixed it. He now has finished, published proof-of-concept code, which allows an attacker 
to exploit any cross-site scripting flaw that may exist in one of these applications to extend, uh, essentially give them access to the underlying OS and run their own code. And remember that cross-site scripting is only, the only thing required is that something that, that an attacker provides is shown on the page. That is, that's the trick, is you want to get, you just want to get something that is that is unfiltered that that that, that has some some t some HTML tags in it that are not being properly encoded. They will be interpreted by the by the, by the JavaScript in order to create the exploit, the, the very common cross-site scripting. So, anyway, the problem is that that this has been fixed. It's been fixed for several months, yet. There are, and I, if, if you look at this, uh, at the, the slash apps, uh, 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 electronis.org slash apps, it is very, I mean, it's incredible how many apps have been written in this. Not just these mainstream big guys, but lots of other apps are, are, are written on top of this platform. Probably because, as you said, it makes it very easy to move something from a web page over to the desktop. Use, using this development platform. So the problem is that in the long term, if these things are not fixed, if people are not keeping them up to date, even if their publishers keep them up to date, which isn't clear will happen, um, this creates a vulnerability that could be exploited for a long time to come. And yeah, you, you have the you have the, the list there, and I mean it just just scrolls on and on and on and on. Many are little you know are obscure little special purpose things, but uh, also the big guys use it as well. Yeah, I mean it's you know this is one of this is a very popular web framework. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably not the best. It's certainly you know fat. But it probably gives you all the functionality you want because you know you got a browser in there. You know how to do CSS yeah, exactly. and JavaScript. You're set. Yep, yep. And unfortunately, you don't want to let things get to the underlying desktop unless it's on purpose. And so this I'm provides surprised it's not sand. Look what WhatsApp uses it. I'm surprised it's not sandboxed. Um, well, they deliberately kept it. Um, uh, they deliberately kept it. Uh, you know, no JS disabled right. because there are so many ways that does give you access to the underlying OS. Right. No, it's just it's a, a very powerful Signal library. Uses it, the desktop. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Signal. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, I, I hope that I hope that P, uh, you know that the developers will fix their apps and people using the apps will keep them current. That uh, what what he found is that essentially. Any vulnerable version of Electron less than 1.7.13, 1 1.8.4, or 2.0.0 beta 3. So they apparently fixed it. Just, I mean, even after, I, I guess, just before 2.0 uh, got finalized, anything younger than that, that has apps built on those, would be vulnerable. And it's not clear whether you could change the framework underneath the app. I think that it's, you can't, that it's all bound together. And so it, it, you can't just, you know, like replace one of the pieces. You probably have to get a new updated whole app kit from the, from the publisher. So, okay. Uh, on, on, under the topic of old flaws never die, which of course we see all the time, uh, three days ago was the first anniversary of WannaCry. Leo, do, do, doesn't time fly? Wow, I can't believe wow. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and and WannaCry was the the was I mean its major innovation was that it used and leveraged the Eternal Blue exploit, which was believed to have come have been developed by, come from and leaked from the from the U.S. Uh, NSA. And of course, it powered the spread of WannaCry, NotPetya, and bad rabbit malware. Um, then it kind of got quiet. Um, what was interesting is that whereas the original Eternal Blue 
only worked with XP, Windows 7, and the equivalent server platform, Server 2008 R2, the underlying flaw in SMB version 1, which is what this used, has since, been, has since then also been made to work under Windows 8, the equivalent Server 2012, and even Windows 10. This, this essentially broadening to the entire Windows platform hugely increased the exploit's ability to infect and has, has basically turned it into a commodity among malware authors. I have a, an, a, a chart from ESET which shows over the last year, so here is a one-year period of time, this essentially the life cycle so far of, of the Eternal Blue exploit. WannaCry itself is still active and attempting to find and infect anything that comes online publicly, a any systems that come online publicly. And so we, we can see here, you, you have it on screen now, a, a, a big jump in its activity. Then it went, it, it got blocked and kind of went silent. But then as other platforms have come on stream and as it's been moved into sort of the default toolkit for exploitation, uh, it's continued to grow and is, is, uh, is beginning to approach the, the original um, the exploitation le level of activity. So um, just as Code Red and NIMDA continue their search for new victims, uh, WannaCry is itself is active, but the Eternal Blue exploit is being leveraged by an increasing uh, breadth of malware in general. Um, we talked about these GPON routers that were the optical fiber-based routers being being offered by uh, several ISPs. Um, naturally, the news got out. Botnets that were active uh, decided to uh, increase their own activity and jump over to those. So now... We, and you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, we have the the uh, the Hey Jimmy <laughs> botnet <laughs> that we, hey, that we talked about. Hey Jimmy, uh, Metal, and of course Mirai that has been a lot of the news. Uh, one that we haven't talked about, Mushstick, and then also the Satori botnet. So we've talked about Hey Jimmy, Mirai, and Satori, three of those five in the past. Well, they're now they've switched their attention. To these uh, GPON routers, and that's really what we're sort of seeing now is that botnets are being taken seriously. They are they're being maintained and updated, and at the mo at this time, it looks like something just shy of one quarter million routers are that is there are one quarter million GPON routers. Um, and when I say shy, it looks like it's about 240,000, which are vulnerable. They, um, the, the firm G VPN Mentor was the, was the discoverer of this GPON vulnerability. And, uh, and unfortunately, the ISP is very uncooperative. They're denying, s still dragging their heels, denying that there are that many v uh, vulnerable routers still present, even though... People are scanning for them and infecting them. I mean, there's botnets running on them. So um, they have an unofficial antidote patch. I, I, if, I, I don't know whether any of our listeners have GPON routers, um, but it's, it's clever. They, they have a, a means of patching the router where, and I've got the link here in the show notes, it's www.vpnmentor.com under their tools directory is a GPON router antidote patch. Um, they caution that, it's, that it is not official, that of course any, any official patch needs to come from the vendor and should, but this vendor is not looking like it's in any hurry. And Leo, if you scroll down You'll, you'll see a, a, a field that you fill in. Essentially, you, you give them 
the internal IP of your gateway and the Telnet um, password that would allow you to log on to your router. So what happens is they then that that brings up a page on your browser, which is now inside your LAN. It runs script, which connects to your router's Telnet interface on the LAN side, uses the password you gave it in order to then load a patch onto the router. And I'm sure afterwards they tell you to change the password and, of Telnet. And you, val you verify this is entirely safe and, <laughs> and completely okay. Well, again, um, at this point, uh, if somebody had a GPON, one of these vulnerable routers, <laughs> you know GPN worse routers, off, are you? I guess exactly. You're in bad. You're in bad shape already. And your ISP they didn't is really, apparently. They didn't need you to do this. They could do it themselves. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So probably the best course of action would be to say, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and these guys appear to have their, their their hearts in the right place. So. Yeah, to, to, to the degree we can trust anyone, uh, these guys seem about as trustworthy as you could get. Or, you know, again, what choice do you have? Yeah, this uh, and, wood chipper is getting louder. Are they are they getting uh, closer? <laughs> uh, I, I think that the, I think they're 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 the trunks are getting larger. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably right. They were doing the little skinny branches. Now they're doing the big boy, big boys. Yeah. Well, we'll just live with it. That's fine. Yeah. So. In this week's, as I described it at the top of the podcast, this week's shocking insecurity head shaker. It's like, you know, what year is this? Is this 1995? Bleeping Computer reported the news of, get this, 5,000 routers with no Telnet password exposed to the public. That's uh, just incredible. Researchers with New Sky Security which is a cybersecurity company specializing in IoT security, discovered that the, that the exposed devices were Datacom routers from a Brazilian ISP OI Internet, which, which, which OI Internet had provided to their customers. There were three of these Datacom routers, DM991CR, DM706CR and DM991CS. They were found to have blank Telnet authentication um, with the Telnet port wide open to the internet accepting all comers. The researcher who, who discussed this with Bleeping Computers reporter said that the router's manuals clearly indicate that the, that the devices are designed to come with a passwordless enabled Telnet service by default and that users are then expected to configure the password for themselves. So I'm just like, how does this happen in 2018 that, that, that first of all, a manufacturer can offer a router with a unconfigured Telnet service running on the WAN interface with no password. How, how does it happen? I just, it's just, I, I'm, I'm stunned that that could be the case. But uh, I, I just, I know, I guess maybe they weren't meant to be consumer routers or the presumption is because they were OEM'd, the, the presumption was that any OEM would, of course, you know, turn the service off or lock down, you know, just turn Telnet off completely on the WAN side or or pr provide a a a good username and password. I just, you know, again, so, somehow some miscommunication. But wow, unbelievable that I mean, imagine buying a new router, um, which no consumer has any idea what to do with. They just plug it in and assume it's an appliance, yet it's got Telnet wide open. Wow. Um, okay, one more, then we'll take our second break. Um, uh, 
the, I have a link here to the PDF that I, that I put a copy of on GRC's server since, since you had to go through some rigmarole in order to get it. And I didn't want to ask all of our listeners to do that. And it's, it, you know, it's not a, behind a paywall or anything. And they, they've got all of their advertising all over it. Um, these are the – this was the highlights of the security form from the recent RSA security conference. And the, I got a, a kick. Uh, down lower are a bunch of pie charts. But get this. Only 47 percent of organizations patch vulnerabilities as soon as they are known. So less than half of organizations patch immediately. 16% wait for one month, while 8% admitted to only applying patches once or twice a year. So, I mean, th this is good news for bad guys. Here are here, and these are people attending the RSA conference. You could argue that this is not even a representative cross-section of, of enterprises. This is RSA security conference attendees saying, eh, yeah, you know, half of them don't do them as soon as they're known. 16% wait a month, 8%, eh, we get around to it once or twice a year. Wow. Um, okay. Also, 16% of organizations have ignored, I mean, admitted. Now, th this is admission on, on, on a survey at RSA. 16% of organizations have ignored a critical security flaw because they didn't have the skills to rectify it, while 26%, okay, right, one quarter, have ignored a critical security flaw because they didn't have time to fix it. It's like, yeah, okay, critical, but yeah, we're busy. We're busy here. One in one in four firms. When asked what route they would take to hack their own companies, and I thought this was a really great question. When asked what what they would do to hack their own companies, 21% say would they they would enter through the company's public cloud hosted computing while 34% so one in three said they would use social engineering if asked to hack their own company um, when asked if they expected that attack would be successful 71% said it was likely or highly likely that they could succeed from outside hacking into their own company only 9% said it was very unlikely their attack would succeed. And this is where I also mentioned that three out of four percent of uh, three out of four of the organizations use a commercial cloud provider as part of their infrastructure. And then finally, only 17% of organizations, and these tend to be sizable, you know, they're RSA attendees have ever hired a penetration tester, a pen tester, to assess, to, 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 you know, objectively, externally, assess the security of their own networks. Of those, so of those 17%, 46% found a critical flaw which could have put their organization at risk, which I would imagine our listeners do not find surprising. However, 35% believe that if they were to hire a pen testing service, although they haven't, they would not surface any new risks. So that, to me, that sounds like, you know, CIO uh, or CTO hubris where they're like, oh, no, I, I'm in charge of security. We haven't hired anybody. And if they did, it would just be a waste of time and money because we're secure. Right. Right. Um, and on that note, Leo, let's take our second break, and then we will uh, continue with the podcast. Indeed, indeed. Oh, I got to move this camera out from <laughs> in front of me here. It's playing with a little uh, GoPro uh, 360 camera. We're going to see if we can use that to do shows. Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're 
doing hiring in your business, you know that the person you hire is probably, you know, a it's a it's a brick, a building block for your company. But uh, you know, if you use uh, crumbly bricks, your building going to fall down. You hire the wrong people, your company's not long <laughs> long for this world. And uh, conversely, let's let's be optimistic. You hire a great employee. Uh, everything just sings, right? That's why you want to do it right. And that's why you want to use ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter helps you find people, great people, faster, better than anything you're doing right now. Something better than just posting your job online and kind of hoping for the best results. ZipRecruiter posts your listing to 100 plus job sites, but they even go one step farther, when you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash security now, they learn what you're looking for with your job posting. They identify people with the right experience. Then they invite them, invite them to apply for your job. These invitations have really changed how you might find your next hire. 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. 80%. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive right there in the ZipRecruiter interface. So you'll not you'll never miss a great match. The right candidate is out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all sizes, from the very biggest to our little company here, have used ZipRecruiter. Now you can try it free. Free if you go to ziprecruiter.com slash security now. ZipRecruiter.com slash security now zip recruiter is the smartest way to hire fastest and easiest for you to zip recruiter.com slash security now now back to steve who is happily ensconced they've chipped all the trees i think they're done they've <laughs> ground it up into <laughs> dust <laughs> and you, you suddenly the view is uh, is of uh, crystal clear skies <laughs> so um Bitdefender Labs has identified the first persistent IoT malware. We've talked many times about how these infections just live in in like our router's RAM and that a just a power down and reset, reboot, you know, power back up, whatever, is enough to clear it out. Well, turns out that was then. Um, it um, Bitdefender Labs has found a what they call the hide and seek botnet they first discovered it earlier this year and have had their eyes on it tracking its its evolution and progress it's infected close to 90,000 unique devices not only routers apparently IPTV cameras and as i mentioned what we're seeing now is just much more sophistication in botnet uh, seriousness than previously. Um, what one of the things that caught their eye is that this one, this botnet, establishes a peer-to-peer -peer command and control network using UDP with a fully custom, homegrown peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So this creates a mesh of connected botnets, which which creates much more connectivity than we normally see. Normally, as we know, botnets all refer back to some command and control con server somewhere, which makes them easy to take down just by taking that one server offline. Suddenly, they're all sitting around waiting to, to get instructions, and none are forthcoming. Here, by creating a mesh of interconnected botnets, all you have to do is talk to any one and this will propagate the, the command and control system throughout that that highly in interconnected mesh, uh, which makes it virtually impossible to take this down. So this is a big step forward. Also, unlike the previous botnets which lived in RAM, this one uses the various brute forcing of Telnet access to get root and, assume, and now, even though previous infections, various malware might have been able to getting root, it wasn't using the root privilege to write itself into persistent storage. This hide-and-seek botnet does. Uh, it gets into Telnet 
uh, using brute force, identifying devices, you using a a bunch of well-known uh, default admin usernames and passwords. We've talked about how effective those can be in the past. Once it has that, it copies itself into the forward slash, et cetera, forward slash init.d directory. So it gets run whenever this device reboots. Uh, and this includes routers and IPTVs. It also has 10 different binaries compiled for various platforms, including x86, x64, the, the two, you know, 32 and 16 bit Intel chips, ARM, both Little Endian and Big Endian, Super H, and PowerPC, among others. So, I mean, I like, you know, a lot of work has gone into putting this thing together. And uh, as I said, it's now installing itself permanently into the firmware of the devices it infects and establishing a persistent and very hard to kill uh, UDP communication mesh between it and all the others. Oh, and when it gets installed, it then begins scanning its neighborhood for other infected botnets. It also closes the door behind it so that nobody else, no other malware is able to, to, to follow it in through the telnet port in order to infect that device. So, I mean, you know, this is what you would design if you were very competent and you wanted to create a, a persistent malware network out on the public internet. And it actually exists. It's not science fiction. Um, okay. As I mentioned at the top of the show, um, I wanted to address a, um, a misconception. Um, this is, uh, and, and I want to thank, it looks like Ellie Riggs in Tallahassee and, uh, the subject was VCC city. And I didn't know if that was it, an abbreviation for Vatican, uh, because of course, father, father Robert shared with us the fact that, uh, Spinrite was now being used at the Vatican oh, for, that's neat. I didn't hear that. for, that's great. for recovering hard drives. Yeah. He, uh, he left his copy w uh, there, uh, <laughs> with an associate and, uh, <laughs> it's awesome. success. It's so, you know, it's, it's been blessed now. Uh, we had made it up to the altitude of this international space station. Uh, now we've made it up to an I even think it's higher even altitude. Higher. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Goodness. So, um, so anyway, so this person writes, Hey, Steve Arino, great show. As always, your spin right testimonial was incomplete after repairing an unbootable drive. And then we have in all caps shouting by a new hard drive or upgrade to an SSD. Do not continue using a failing hard drive. So I wanted to take a minute to address that because first of all, I absolutely agree. You should not continue using a failing hard drive, but, but an unbootable drive or a drive that Spinrite is able to repair doesn't mean the drive is failing. We need to remember, first of all, drives have a huge uh, backup of spare sectors. Why do they have spare sectors? Because in the normal course of, ser of their service life, they're expecting sectors to fail. And when sectors fail, the drive says, whoops, and, and, essentially takes that sector out of service, moving that sector's data into one of the spares in, in the pool of spares. Sectors fail over time just through the actual, the, 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 the head flying over the surface is flying very closely and there is a, a tiny mechanical stress that the, that the, that the head and the and the surface platter put on each other. So there's a little bit of flexure and over time that can evolve a defect. What normally happens is the drive will see 
that it's that there's a problem forming. But again, remember that drives are performing error correction now all the time. And the use of ECC used to mean, oh, my God, thank goodness we're able to recover the data from the sector. Stop using the sector. Now, ECC is, yeah, OK, fine. We corrected another error. The idea is that <laughs> that just keep on going. It's yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. I would and imagine on some of these four and eight terabyte drives, you're probably getting ECC failures pretty constantly. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, and in fact, that's one of the things that Spinrite shows is the rate of error correction. You know, it's not zero. It's an it's startling. And so what really happens is when the rate of error correction begins to increase, that's an indication that you've got a problem with your drive. But what's so cool about ECC is that what, what the error correction math creates it, through this cool ECC technology, it creates an XOR bit mask, which, which is a pattern of ones where the bits are wrong and an offset for where uh, in, the, in the sectors, typically 40, 96 bits, where the mask should be applied in order to flip the wrong bits to make them right. That's called the syndrome. And, and so, so naturally, the first bit of the syndrome is a one, and the last bit of the syndrome is a one. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, you'd remove the zeros, and then the, last, the first bit would be a one, and the last bit would be a one. The point is... The distance between the, the first one and the last one is the number of bits in error. And the drive will watch that and happily correct them until some threshold. And because there's a limit to how long a run of error it's able to correct. So as the problem grows over time, at some point... The drive says, uh-oh, that we're like past a threshold of comfort. So while I can still correct the sector, I'm going to correct it one last time and take it out of service. Now, that's that's the everything going well scenario. Of course, Spinrite is typically brought in when the every going, everything going well scenario fails. And so, so that's where Spinrite comes in with the just give us the data one last time, please. Just, just once more. We'll never ask for it again. Just one more time. And it often does, in which case the, it, it and the drive breathe a huge sigh of relief. The sector is taken out of service and the corrected data is relocated. The point being, this isn't the failure of the drive. This is a sector that was allowed to get outside of the drive's correction tolerance band. But once fixed, everything is fine. So, so it's, it's again, SSD is using and relying on error correction. Hard drives are using and critically relying on error correction. I mean, we couldn't have, I mean, if, if you, there just aren't drives that aren't correcting errors now all the time. Some of them are soft. Some of them, if you retried, you would get a, a perfect read, except the drive would, would is wants to be fast rather than safe. It's biased in that direction. So it just goes ahead and says, okay, I had to correct the data. Maybe if I tried again, I wouldn't, but I have correction able to do on the fly without slowing down. So I'm going to just keep going. So, you know, that that's what's happening. So anyway, I just did. I sort of wanted to um, note that a failure that Spinrite corrects can just be that a sort of a transient problem in one spot where something got a little bit out of the, you know, out of control on the drive. But the drive has plenty of spares and plenty of service life remaining. Spinrite, you know, and again, running Spinrite from time to time keeps all of this from getting to the point where you may not be able to recover it. Okay, and 
from Eric Paul in Chesapeake, Virginia. And, and this was the guy that I referred to at the top as uh, his, his subject line is still need HTTP sites. And he said, he wrote, I just heard you on security now that there is no longer a need for HTTP sites. I have an issue with that statement. At my house, I have an old Netgear router that supports HTTPS access, but due to its age, it uses a self-signed SSL3 cert. Since modern browsers, and actually it's, pro you know, certs don't have a, a protocol. There's no such thing as an SSL3 cert. I'm assuming he means, for example, an SHA-1 cert, which is probably what he's referring to. Since modern browsers have decided that they will absolutely not allow access to SSL3 sites, and actually he means SHA-1 certs, signed certs, I had to use an old version of IE. That would do it. Uh, that is SHA-1, which still allowed SSL, he says SSL3, he means SHA-1 certs, to remove HTTPS, HTTPS only access so that I can use a modern browser to access the router. Oh, I see. So he used, he used an old version of IE to turn off HTTPS only on his Netgear, thus then, then allowing him to use HTTP only on modern browsers. So that was nicely done, Eric. He says, due to this reason, I had to convert both of my routers to HTTP only access since I assume that at some time in the future, all browsers will punish the self-signed certs used by both routers, with, by both of those routers with no exceptions allowed. Um, so I, I take his point. Um, and I, I, and I imagine a bunch of our listeners are beginning to encounter things like that, where where this assumption by browsers and enforcement by browsers of the latest security standards are beginning to collide and clash with some of our older devices that don't that aren't updatable and don't support the latest security protocols. So anyway, I just sort of wanted to to thank Eric for noting that. Uh, and I'll mention that, you know, I did I did mention that a recent um, Asus router of mine, I was delighted to see that it was um, it was uh, obtaining its own Let's Encrypt certificate for itself. I thought that was a very cool use of of online real time certificate generation. Um, but. Uh, I have encountered myself older devices where it is necessary to jump through some hoops in order to access them because the newer browsers just say no nope, or, you know, cough up a whole bunch of errors that you have to like fight your way through in order to still use uh, what is older security. But in this instance, for example, there's zero danger in using HTTP to access the management of your own router on your own LAN. It's just like, you know, that there's just nothing wrong with doing that. Yet the, the browser says, no, no SHA-1 certs are allowed. Okay, so uh, the two ultra-clever attacks. And Leo, on the second page here, or, oh, no, it's a third page down, I have a, a picture that captures this that I will be explaining, but you're going to want to show that when we get to what this is. So the first one is the PGP and S mime. Um, okay, so uh, it's not a new vulnerability. It's a brilliantly clever leveraging of an original design flaw in encrypted email which affects encrypted email, thus PGP and SMIME. The EFF wrote, and I'm quoting them, users are advised to disable email encryption plugins 
to avoid any attackers from recovering past encrypted emails after the paper's publication. And that did happen. It was supposed to happen today, but news leaked out, and so it was published yesterday. The EFF wrote, These steps are intended as a temporary conservative stopgap until the immediate risk of the exploit has passed and been mitigated against by the wider community. They said users in dire need of using encryption to protect their communications channels are advised to use an instant messaging client that supports end-to-end encryption, uh, the EFF recommended. And then in a follow-up, the EFF said, not so pretty, what you need to know about e-fail and the PGP flaw. And again, it's eh, not a PGP flaw. Um, They wrote, a group of researchers released a paper today, this was yesterday, that describes a new class of serious vulnerabilities in PGP, including GPG, the most popular email encryption standard. The new paper includes a proof of concept exploit that can allow an attacker to use the victim's own email client to decrypt previously acquired messages and return the decrypted content to the attacker without alerting the client. The proof of concept is only one implementation of this new type of attack. And that's the key. This is a new attack. This is not a new vulnerability. And variants may follow in coming days. So the site where this is all put up, uh, for anyone who's interested, is eFail, E-F-A-I-L dot D-E. Okay. And so the ultra short attention getting version is an attacker who had previously obtained any encrypted email that is someone's encrypted email through, for example, passive monitoring or maybe by pulling from an encrypted stored repository. Encrypted, not clear text. The encrypted version. Encrypted, yes. So, so, So if there's like like email sitting on a server somewhere or on a cloud somewhere, which is encrypted so that only that the user's client is able to see it. They are able through this incredibly clever, I mean, just as I said, this is just going to, this is just amazingly cool. Um, uh, or as Matt, Matt uh, Green called it, a masterpiece can induce the, the recipient's, that is the intended recipient's email client to decrypt and exfiltrate, that is to send the decrypted content. Okay, so a little more background first. Matthew Green on May 14th, yesterday, tweeted, it was a series of like nine tweets. He said, new vulnerabilities, and, and he gets it right, in many GPG and SMIME enabled email clients allows exfiltration of plain text, meaning decrypted content, by mauling, M-A-U-L-I-N-G, by mauling HTML emails. And he says a few thoughts, which then follow in these following texts or in following tweets. He says, in a nutshell, if I encrypt and in, if I intercept, sorry, if I intercept an encrypted email sent to you, I can modify that email into a new encrypted email that contains custom HTML. In many GUI email clients, this HTML can exfiltrate the plain text to a remote server. Ouch, he he concludes tweet number two. And then he continues, it's an extremely cool attack and kind of a masterpiece in exploiting bad crypto combined with a whole lot of sloppiness on the part of email client developers. The real news here, he writes, is probably about SMIME, which is actually used in corporate email settings. Attacking and modifying encrypted email stored on servers 
could actually happen. So this is a big deal. Plus, the attack on S mime is straightforward because it's, he says, A, a dumb protocol and B, a simple protocol not filled with legacy cruft and C, it's built into email clients. He says, dumb and simple and one vendor, that is your client, your email client vendor to blame. But he says, of course, the attack also implicated the garage, I'm sorry, the garbage fire that is the PGP ecosystem. So, of course, that's what everyone is talking about. He says over on HN, the quote, it's not PGP, it's email clients, unquote, dance has begun. So, so I guess we have to talk about that. He says when it comes to PGP, the quality expectations are, on the crypto are low because it was invented in the pre-Cambrian era. <laughs> and yes, 27 years ago, and Phil Zimmerman was way ahead of his time, but things have changed. PGP hasn't. He says it was invented in the pre-Cambrian era. So it doesn't do proper authentication except as an optional afterthought. So in summary, PGP clients are vulnerable because 17 years after a vulnerability was known, the mitigation was not made a default in GNU PG and defense was instead, quote, left to PGP clients, unquote, which also make a convenient scapegoat when it goes pear-shaped. Okay, so... What he's referring to 17 years ago is that we learned that it was necessary to not only encrypt, but to authenticate. And we've talked about that often on this podcast. It is not sufficient to encrypt. You also have to absolutely guarantee against modification. And that's what PGP is missing. And as a consequence, the mistake made by GUI email clients can occur. Okay, so um, get this. This is just so. This is just so toe curlingly cool. Um, email wanted to be able to contain more than just hello, some text, and goodbye. It you wanted to have attachments. You wanted to have images. You wanted to do more than just. Um, than, than just a simple, plain text thing. So that created MIME, M-I-M-E, um, which, uh, which is an extension. First of all, M-I-M-E stands for Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions. And it allows multi-part email where you have you have well-defined boundaries marking the beginning and end of sections. Okay, so get this. The, 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 this, this mauling, M-A-U-L-I-N-G, the, 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 what, what, what a bad guy does is they, they create a new email where the first section is the beginning of an HTTP image tag. So they do an open bracket IMG space and then SRC, which is where you're going to specify the source of the image. And then they use HTTP colon slash slash evil domain, right? So that's because this is the domain that is going to receive the decrypted email. Then they do a forward slash and end that st section. That is, they leave the image tag source URL open. Then, as the second part of, of this new multi-part email, they drop in the encrypted, original encrypted email that they can't read. It's encrypted you know, strongly encrypted by, by, by PGP or S mime, whatever. Then 
the th- then and then they close that second section. Now the third section is simply a closing quote on the URL and the closing angle bracket for the image tag. So what this is is they've essentially they've turned the, they've created a new piece of email which is nothing but an image tag with a with a prepended domain to receive the email and the body of the the encrypted body of the email as the URL of this image tag so this gets th- th- this is sent to the client the email client says oh um in order to display this i need to decrypt this middle part which is encrypted with pgp or smime whatever it decrypts it and now you have all in plain text an image tag where the url where the url from the root of the url is itself the plain te- the decrypted plain text message the browser the, the 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 client will url encode it so for example a space character which is not url safe will get turned into a percent 20 for example and so forth and it will then query EvilDomain.com for the contents of that image. Okay. That is to display the image. That is cool. <laughs> Isn't that cool, yeah, Leo? Cool. Oh gosh. Yes. And so, so what happens is EvilDomain.com has it has a has a query coming in to it for to have an image displayed by the user's client. Which is and the the URL is the decrypted email. Oh, it's just sublimely I, gorgeous. I I do think though that it's a stretch to blame PGP and S mime. Oh, agreed. For it's this. not a no. That's bad I, behavior I, on the email client's part. Right? Correct. Conflating all, these all, three all, parts. Although had had PGP right. been authenticating right. it would have recognized that the envelope had changed and then and then and then refused to decrypt right. so which it, it should have it done should, obviously yeah yeah but this is just a bad behavior in fact the email client i use for the most part clause mail doesn't do this because it doesn't do html so correct and and that was that is the advice is you want to use a, a client that will not do html because then it will not Look at this image tag and go. Oh, I need to go oh, find the image oh, in order. In or- oh. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so to conclude, the EFF says under what to do about this. It, the, the they say, and I think they're correct in this. We are in an uncertain state, where it is hard to promise the level of protection users can expect of PGP without giving a fast changing and increasingly complex set of instructions and warnings. PGP usage, they write, was always complicated and error prone. With this new vulnerability, it is currently impossible to give simple, reliable instructions on how to use it with modern email clients. It's also hard to tell people to move off using PGP in email permanently. There's no other email encryption tool that has the adoption levels, multiple implementations, and open standards support that would allow us to recommend it as a complete replacement for PGP. They say Perens SMIME, the leading alternative, suffers from the same problems and is more vulnerable to the attacks described in the paper. They say, they, they conclude, there are, however, other end-to-end secure messaging tools that provide similar levels of security. For instance, Signal. If you need to communicate securely during this period of uncertainty, we recommend you consider these alternatives. So anyway, uh, uh, very cool. I mean, mostly just sublimely clever attack. The idea of, of subverting image rendering on a client handling encryption 
to induce it to decrypt on the fly and then get the get the the decrypted text exfiltrated via the URL of a, of a remote image is that just <laughs> that's just so cool. So so that's really why I wanted to share this was like was like just wow, you know, very clever. Um, okay, and uh, and so yes, Leo, I think that the takeaway is for for people who want to use email. So so the danger is just to uh, explain it. If there exists the ability of an attacker to obtain or to have obtained encrypted content, the danger is that now they will create they will create a new piece of email and 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 send it to someone whose HTML enabled PGP or SMIME or it doesn't really matter what encryption will attempt to render the image and in the process send the clear text back out. So anyone can disable that by prevent that by by using a client to view email that will not render HTML. In which Thomas, case it will everybody, every participant in the email has to be using that client. So there is a weak link. If there are multiple recipients, I'm not sure. Ah, true. Yeah, Good point. That's a weak yeah. link. Um, and, and Matthew Green points this out. The attacker can perform e-fail attacks if only one of the participants is vulnerable. Now, what yeah. is unclear to me, maybe you could explain it, is it, he implies that even if a sender is vulnerable, didn't, doesn't it have to be that somebody with the private key would be, you know, somebody who could decrypt the email would have to be vulnerable? Because otherwise, I mean, a sender can't decrypt it. He can only encrypt it, right? Yeah, I agree. I don't see how that how the sender yeah so it, how it, the sender would be vulnerable. It implies somehow, but I think really, if I if I'm understanding this, really only somebody with the ability to decrypt the email. Correct. Correct. So that because person, you are leveraging the client's right, own decryption. Right. Yes. However, if multiple recipients you know are intended, and you've That's encrypted true. with multiple. Uh, pu public keys, and I guess you could then uh, use one of the recipient's vulnerable yep. email. So everybody yep. should just stop using HTML email, which I've said for years. One yep. more reason to hate HTML email. Oh, boy. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm and sure was... PGP will be fixed quickly on this. I would expect. Uh... No? Let me look. go look at GBG tools, because that's what... I, I don't use PGP. I use the open GNU Privacy Guard. So I, you know, that means there's, yeah, this the, is the problem is this, the, yeah, the, um, assuming that Matthew's solution, which is to say to add authentication, the, every, the, the sender needs to append, you know, n needs to add authentication and the client needs to verify. So it's difficult. I mean, that's why it hasn't happened yet. Even yeah, the GPG tools, years. people say that the next version of the suite 2018.2 will include mitigations against this vulnerability and will be released this week. So this Good. is the one I recommend anyway that people use GPG tools. And um, that pres I presume that means, this is for the Mac, but I presume that means that GPG is also being uh, fixed. And of course, the other fix is to not use your email client to read your mail. But again, all, re all recipients, intended recipients, would have to be doing this. Let's see. Uh, actually, don't use your... If you use the don't command use any line. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? So I'm going to get a blob, an encrypted blob in my email client, take it, and decrypt it off to the side. Don't give the email client access to the decrypted version. Right. right. Well, actually, don't give anything that renders HTML right. access. Right. Right. So, like, it, right. Even if, if, so put it on the yeah. – you could do it in the command line. That would be safe. Or put it on the clipboard, and you can – in most cases, GPG can decrypt the clipboard. Maybe that would be risky, too. Put it in the command line. Save it as a text yeah. file and put it in the, and decrypt yeah. it with the command line. And and keep it away from your browser. Because, yeah, of course, right. browsers were the first things right. to do HTML. Right. right. Wow. Yeah. So, Rowhammer becomes Throwhammer. Uh, clever renaming. I like that a lot. Um, and this is from uh, uh, some researchers from the universities uh, in Amsterdam and Cyprus that have very cleverly... 
I would say invented a brand new remote means for launching Rohammer attacks via network packets and network cards. Uh, I, you know, I could just imagine them sitting around brainstorming new ways to pound on RAM. And they realized that in like one of those aha moments that very much like whoever it was who figured out this incredible hack for PGP or, or encrypted email and, and using HTML rendering and multi-part messages, um, these guys realized that the latest and fastest network connections were employing a technique known as RDMA, and it's actually rather widespread at high, in high-end networking. As you might imagine, it stands for remote direct memory access. It turns out that's what all cloud providers and, and high-bandwidth networking solutions use. Um, RDMA has a Wikipedia page, lots of resources on the net, um, and I'm going to share from their paper because they they couch this. I mean, they they explain this nicely and also explain what they did. They said, and I'm just jumping in the middle. However, advanced attack. Uh, now they're talking about the like the history. Um, uh, they said, however, however advanced the attacks have become. That is previous Rohammer attacks, and however worrying for the research community, these Rohammer attacks never progressed beyond local privilege escalations or sandbox escapes. And that's, of course, true. That's what we've been talking about. They write, the attacker needs the ability to run code on the victim machine in order to flip bits in sensitive data. Hence, Rohammer posed little threat from attackers without code execution on the victim machine. And that's, of course, how we were, to some degree, uh, keeping from staying awake at night and not worrying too much about, about what was happening. They say, in this paper, we show that this is no longer true and that attackers can flip bits only by sending network packets to a victim machine connected to RDMA-enabled networks commonly used in clouds and data centers. They say, Rohammer allows attackers to flip a bit in one physical memory location by aggressively reading or writing other locations, i.e. hammering the memory. As bit flips occur at the physical level, they are beyond the control of the operating system and may well cross security domains. Of course, we've covered this extensively on this podcast. A row hammer attack requires the ability to hammer memory sufficiently fast to trigger bit flips in the victim. Doing so is not always trivial, as several levels of caches in the memory hierarchy often absorb most of the memory requests. To address this hurdle, attackers resort to accessing cache eviction buffers or using direct memory access for hammering. But even with these techniques in place, triggering a bit flip still requires hundreds of thousands of memory accesses to specific DRAM locations within tens of milliseconds. As a result, the current assumption is that Rohammer may only serve local privilege escalation, but not to be used to launch attacks from over the network. In this paper, we revisit this assumption. While it is true that millions of DRAM accesses per second is harder to accomplish from across the network than from code executed locally, Today's networks are becoming very fast. Modern NICs, network interface controllers, you know, uh, LAN adapters, are able to transfer large amounts of network traffic to remote memory. In our experimental setup, we observed bit flips when accessing memory 560,000 times in 64 milliseconds, which translates 
to 9 million accesses per second. Even regular 10 gig Ethernet cards can easily send 9 million packets per second to a remote host that ends up being stored in the host's memory. They ask the question, might this be enough for an attacker to affect a row hammer attack from across the network? In the remainder of this paper, we demonstrate that this is the case and that attackers can use these bit flips induced by network traffic to compromise a remote server application. To our knowledge, this is the first reported use of a row hammer attack over the network. Specifically, we manage to flip bits remotely using a commodity 10 gig network. We rely on the commonly deployed RDMA technology in clouds and data centers for reading, and of course though that's the ideal target for this, for reading from remote DMA buffers quickly to cause row hammer corruptions outside these untrusted buffers. These corruptions allow us to compromise a remote server without relying on any software bug. So, um, a again, you couldn't get a better example of attacks never get worse. They only ever get stronger. We have now Throw Hammer, which uses the, the fact that we've got very high-speed connections to servers um, and those servers being the ideal targets for at, you know, as victims, uh, being the recipient of bit flips that can then be used uh, to get up to mischief. Like, for example, we saw if you could flip the bit on memory access permission tables, you then immediately give uh, a process, a benign process running on that machine, act, but, but without any uh, code execution capabilities, suddenly it gets access to all of memory on the physical uh, computer. So what this necessitates downstream will be that the communications buffers used by the NICs can no longer be in main memory. They cannot, they're going to have to be sequestered into memory, uh, maybe static memory, maybe on NIC memory. Something's going to have to be done or the DRAM is going to have to be hardened so that it is no longer subject to row hammer attack. So another beautiful piece of work and uh, something that was a local only attack now becomes, uh, you know, networkable. So beautiful work. And, uh, and again, another piece of uh, really nice engineering. Nice. Throw hammer is a good name too. And of course that's <laughs> great. Very important have the right name. Got to have a good name and yeah. a good website. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I was looking at the uh, email client I use on the Mac, uh, MailMate, good. and yep. he said I was notified February 10th by uh, Matthew Green and Company and mitigated mid-March. Ah, so I th nice. You know, so... Um, it's been out there for a it's while. It's been out there. And the so one of the problems with that list that EFF has published and Matthew published is that it's on older pers pieces of the older versions of the software name including mailmate it's on a december edition and he had fixed it by march so um you should just you so, know, up, so update your clients update and your see client. whether they, the yeah. the uh, clients have already mitigated it themselves he said uh, at the time i didn't in put any real information in the update notes the release notes right. because i didn't want to right. telegraph what was going on but i can right. tell you now that that was a mitigation for e-fail so one hopes that a lot of these clients would have handled it by now otherwise just keep using Good. mutt you know, it's it works. It's good. Harmless. Yes. Mostly. Steve Gibson is uh, the guy in charge of this whole kettle of fish, and we're glad he's here. You can find more about Steve at grc.com. That's his website, where you'll also find uh, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive recovery and maintenance utility, and uh, all the free stuff, tons of which is on the site. You could spend days just browsing through the site. <laughs> But among other things, you'll find this podcast there, uh, not only audio, but also transcriptions of every word.
beautifully carved into stone. By Lovingly Wayne transcribed. Ferris. Lovingly yeah. transcribed. So uh, go to grc.com. Uh, the transcriptions mean you can also search there for anything in any of the previous 600-some episodes. Have you hit 666? Twit did. Oh, we got three more Twit before the, 663, the, mark, yep. the mark of the beast. All right. Coming, coming soon <laughs> to a podcast near you. Uh, <laughs> you can get audio and video of the show from um, our website, twit.tv slash sn. You can also subscribe. Or, you know, one thing a lot of people like to do is watch live and chat about it in the chat room. There's always a lot of great back talk uh, going on, and uh, it's a great way to get additional information about the subjects we cover. Uh, here's the deal. We do the show about 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays. That's 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. The chat room is at irc.twit.tv. The live stream is at twit.tv slash live. So enjoy. That's a great way to consume it. But even if you do it that way, you do want to subscribe so that you'll have every episode on your Security Now bookshelf. And you can do that in any podcast program. There are some written in Electron. <laughs> so... <laughs> you know, Electron, you just like automatically have hundreds of megabytes of support files, just like wow. automatically. Wow. So, yeah. And Horrible. Horrible. A lot of people don't like the <laughs> idea of having Electron apps because each one has its own copy of Chrome. It's like right. installing Chrome Plus. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Have a great have uh, a week. Talk to you next time. Bye. Security now.